Welcome, my friends, to another YouTube version of the BJJ Brick Podcast. I hope you enjoy the show, and if you do, please subscribe to the channel. So here we go. Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends, to episode 199 of the BJJ Brick Podcast. I'm Gary. I got my partner in crime, Byron. How are you, Byron? Gary, I'm doing great. I had a quite extraordinary day of rolling today. I think I got about three to three and a half hours of actual grappling uh, this afternoon and part of the morning. So, uh, well, yeah. I was, was going to say, I, I, somebody told me you drank a couple of gallons of water. No, actually, I drink. I have a little uh, water jug, and it's a quarter of a gallon. I drank four of those while I was there. And, uh, Good it was job, at the, Byron. The Grapple-a-thon for the We Defy Foundation that we were talking about in previous episodes. Yeah, it was put on uh, by a friend of the show, uh, Jeremy Parrish. Um, he did a great job putting it on and uh, uh, getting money f- uh, for the We Defy Foundation. Um, so great job, Jeremy, and, uh, you know, very well-attended event. Yeah, I'm real excited about episode 199, which is this episode. We have Hannah and Vinla on the podcast. They are a very interesting uh, couple on the show here. I've never... Uh, had two people at the same time do an interview, and uh, and I tried to decipher their voices, but I had a little bit of trouble. So <laughs> you get to enjoy me struggling a little bit during the interview process. But really, it's amazing uh, that they're able to accomplish so much, uh, working full time jobs or going to school, and uh, not training at some huge school with all these other you know world class uh, grapplers and world champions, uh, basically. Uh, they have some some really good training methods that have really propelled them to the top of the uh, food chain in the competitive jiu-jitsu scene. And really cool to hear uh, Hannah and Vinla. And this was a interview that uh, our friend Denise uh, recommended we talk to them. So uh, thank you, Denise. Yeah, definitely. Uh, stay tuned for that part. Um, like Byron said, you know they don't train in a huge gym with a bunch of world champions. They're they're very high you know, class in jujitsu and, and they have, uh, they're going to talk about their training methods to get them to that uh, level. So definitely, uh, don't miss the uh, interview. Yeah. Uh, speaking about training methods, uh, I have a newish audio book out. It is called six Brazilian jujitsu training games. And these games are designed for you to play on the mat while you're actually rolling. It kind of gives you a goal or some limitations to put on yourself as you roll, and it really will help you kind of tweak your game and, and make changes to what you're doing on the mat. Uh, I think it's it's sometimes difficult to just say, I want to do this, or, or have an idea of, if I want to you know, start incorporating uh, this particular technique into my game. But if you kind of play around with tweaking your game and setting some limitations, you might really discover some really cool things that are really not that hard to get into your game. And, and that's really the, the goal of this audio book. It's a little over an hour long. It's five ninety nine. The proceeds go to help the podcast stay going strong. And uh, check it out. There'll be a link to it, it and our other audio book in the show notes. Speaking of strong, uh, you should check out uh, Byron's Biceps. Uh, but enough of that. Uh, small talk. Let's get on to our email list. Um, hey, definitely uh, check out the link for our email list. Uh, put your email in there, and each and every week we will uh, notify you of a, of a of a new episode. So that way you'll never miss an episode. And we do have a promise. Uh, it's actually Byron's pinky promise that we will not spam your inbox. So uh, you won't get anything from us but the show each and every week. Yeah, or if uh, for some reason we have some urgent message to give out to everybody, uh, that hasn't happened yet in almost, almost 200 episodes, <laughs> but uh, there there may be a day where I really need to get a message out to everybody, and that would be the way, that would uh, be a good way to do that. Well, I remember uh, the one time you were talking about uh, sending a picture of yourself doing a front double bicep pose, but uh, I talked you out of it. Yeah. So uh, everybody on our email list has me to thank. Yeah, we would have lost a lot of credibility in the podcasting world with that one. <laughs> I, I briefly mentioned the rollathon, Gary. It was really cool. Uh, I never, I don't think I've rolled that long in one day, 
and uh, it was just it had so much fun. I got to see a lot of old friends and, and made a few new ones. We had uh, Jake and David came in from Topeka, and it was nice to meet them and to roll with them. And uh, and a handful of you know normal training partners, handful of people from around the city, and some people I hadn't seen for quite a while. And it was good to just get a ton of mad time. It's like every every time you wanted to roll, grab somebody and roll. And uh, that was a good time. Uh, speaking about lots of rolling, Gary, coming up soon is the BJJ Summer Camp. This is put on by our friends here uh, that we train with in Kansas. Uh, the person putting it on in particular is Jake Smith. And he, he kind of got an idea. And the summer camp is on August 18th, 19th, and 20th. And it's actually at a lake. And, uh, you know, you get a cabin and they provide food. And uh, lots of jujitsu. The instructors include Joe Wilk, Derek Bohai, Jason Bircher, and Jake Smith. So uh, a lot of jujitsu that weekend. Uh, if you want to go for just one day or for two or for the entire event, uh, those are all options. And the the camping or the cabins are described to me as more of a, a glamping, as in glamour camping. Uh, very uh, nice facilities i have yet to be there and it looks like i'm not able to make it this year and i don't think you are either gary but uh, it looks like a really fun thing to do yeah definitely check it out we have a link to it um where you can buy your tickets uh you know one day is only 150 bucks for the whole weekend for those three days that includes four seminars anemones uh food and lodging only 250 bucks i mean incredible deal so definitely uh check out the uh, link and uh, get your tickets and get out there and learn from these four great people meet a whole bunch of cool people and uh, just have the time of your life i mean for us people that do train jujitsu. Remember when we were younger, we had like boy scout camps or, you know, basketball camp or football camp. Like I'd give anything for summer camp. And now we have one here in Wichita or not Wichita, but in the state of Kansas. So, um, you know, and hopefully, uh, you know, this let's, let's get out there and, uh, if you can make it, definitely check it out. And that way, uh, hopefully it'll become a yearly thing. Um, you know, each and every year it'd be neat if, uh, we could show so much support that, uh, we could really get this to take off. Yeah. This, uh, I mentioned that we're not going to be able to be there, but we would like to, if, uh, either one of us could, uh, this yeah. will be a great event. If you're in Kansas or if you're able to get to the, uh, council Grove, uh, lake there, it, it, uh, it'd be, it's going to be fun. And, and I know, I know Jake, uh, what he's organizing is going to be great. And uh, you get to get to train with some of the best here in Kansas, that's for sure. And uh, so just wanted to throw that out there. There'll be a link. It's not an affiliate link or anything like that. It's just us trying to help out our buddies and uh, make sure everybody has a good time. And we think this is a, a great place to, to go train if you have a uh, weekend available. Yep. And if you can't make it for the whole weekend, you can do Saturday only. And, and that Saturday, three seminars. And how about this? A barbecue dinner. And who has a better barbecue than Kansas? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good uh, good point there, Gary. Some of the best barbecue is from Kansas. Yep. So uh, I actually heard some people are just coming for the barbecue dinner. <laughs> Gary might make a brief appearance. <laughs> at the, no, I think we're both Let pretty wrapped it. up that weekend, <laughs> but that would be uh, that'd be a good time to swing by and grab some barbecue. Uh, speaking about you know Kansas, we have a great quote this week, Gary. What does this quote have to do with Kansas? Well, it's from the hockey legend Wayne Gretzky. Is he? He's not from Kansas. You're telling me? I would doubt it. Okay, I don't yeah. know where he's from. I think you're probably. But right I would assume thing. maybe Canada. He probably knew of Kansas's existence. And, yes. Uh, <laughs> and we do have a minor league hockey team in Wichita. So that is great. The quote this week is uh, from Wayne Gret- Gretzky, and he said. I wasn't naturally gifted in terms of size and speed. Everything I did in hockey, I worked for. And that's the way I'll be as a coach. And this is uh, highly relatable, I think, to most grapplers. Most of us don't get on the mat and just start feeling like we're picking it up super easy. You know, uh, Wayne Gretzky wasn't the the, the perfect size uh, for a hockey player, and he didn't hop on the ice I almost said Matt hop on the ice with a lot of speed either and speed's a huge factor in hockey from the best I could gather and uh, but he worked hard for what he uh, was able to develop and he became the greatest 
of all time for hockey there. So um, I think that is inspirational for anybody who wants to get better at something. And it seems like you're having to work very hard for it. Well, so did Wayne Gretzky. And look where he got. And he wants to be that way as a coach. And I, I could take that one of two ways, or maybe both, that he is, uh, as a coach, having to work hard to become a good coach, or he wants to develop uh, athletes that are his students in the same way. Really, he's not looking for the most naturally gifted athletes to, to train and to work with, but he's work, looking to mold people to become great. Yeah, and, uh, you know, one thing is you will see a lot of people who aren't, you know, naturally gifted in, in size or strength or speed. Um, you know, Gary especially for one. In, Yes, me for <laughs> one. Um, but it, it's funny, like, I'll see some guys come in, you know, get on the mat the first time, and you're looking at them, and, you know, they're not very athletic, not very strong, and not very flexible, and you're thinking, oh, boy, this person's going to have a tough time, and um, you know, they just, they start off and, you know, not very good, but they're always working. I, I've seen so many people like that that have just an incredible work ethic, you know, can train, you know, once a day or, or maybe even twice a day, you know, five, six, seven days a week. And, and they just got that incredible work ethic and six months down the road, you just see, you know, how much better they get. And, you know, every month they just keep getting better and better. And it's, uh, you know, a lot of it is due to that, you know, incredibly, you know, hard work that they do, that work ethic that is instilled in them. And, uh, you know, they've got those goals they want to hit. And uh, there's no way that wall is going to stop them. They're just going to smash through it. So, uh, you know, no matter what you do, work hard, you know, smash through all your obstacles and uh, and you're going to be a success. Yep, that's a, it's a good way to go, Kerry. And, Definitely uh, a good way to go. If it, if it worked for Wayne Gretzky, it could maybe work at a fraction for guys like you and me, and we'll be very happy with our grappling. Yeah, definitely be happy. <laughs> so uh, I think, you know, looking at this, this is a good quote, and you could kind of uh, transition this to our interview, Hannah and Vinla. Uh, I don't know how naturally gifted either one of them are on the mat, and maybe that has something to do with their success, but I would bet, and talking to them, you'll understand that they are working very hard for what they're able to do on the mat, and uh, and that is paying off very big. So let's roll our interview with Hannah and Vinla. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. In one of the most dangerous acts of lawn maintenance, I can start a stubborn lawnmower with a a barambolo, and we are not talking about a push mower. If you look closely at UFC 1, you can see me pushing a wheelbarrow full of cash I won from gambling. I eventually invested half the money in Metamoris, and I just wasted the other half. Word on the mat is that I have an identical twin. There's really no other explanation of how I won two different tournaments at the same time. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick Podcast. Stay sweaty, my friends. All right, my friends, I'm happy to bring Vinla and Hannah to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Vinla and Hannah, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We we uh, were talking a little bit before we started the interview, and this this is gonna. I'm really excited to have you guys on the podcast, but it'll be a little bit challenging at first. So uh, as far as figuring out who's talking, so let's start with Hannah. Hannah, could you introduce yourself a little bit to us and and let us kind of know who you are? Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Hannah Hirvonen from uh, uh, from Finland. I'm currently living in Sweden. Uh, because of my studies, so uh, at the moment we're training in Sweden. Uh, I'm a BJJ black belt and a medical student. Um, yeah, so that's uh, mainly how I spend my time. Wow, you're a, a medical student. What in medicine are you studying? Uh, I'm doing my, my my basic studies right now. So I, I'm starting my fourth year, uh, and I'm starting the clinical phase right now. And I will be graduating in two and a half years. So we will, oh, we'll see then what's okay. that, going to be. <laughs> that's really impressive that you uh, are taking your jiu-jitsu so seriously and doing so well at it. And also, 
uh, going to medical school. Are you a- actively competing? Uh, I have been competing a bit less now with the with the medical studies. My my first year year at medical school, I was trying to compete as much as I did before, but that uh, that was a bit too much for me, uh, especially in the beginning. And then last year, unfortunately, I I had a big injury, so I was off the off the competition scene. But I have been doing a comeback now. During this year, I have done uh, two uh, bigger competitions, and hopefully, uh, more will come during the the autumn season. All right, and uh, Vinla, if we can get you to introduce yourself a little bit uh, to us, that would be nice. Yeah, so I am Vinla, also Finland, Vinla Lukonen. The difficult Finnish name. And uh, yeah, uh, besides Jiu Jitsu, I'm a primary school teacher. And basically, the story goes as Hannah that I have also <laughs> moved to Sweden because we are also married. So I followed her here. And now we are training here. Here in Sweden, this is our third year here. And uh, yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> and so you're a, a school teacher and you also uh, compete in jiu-jitsu and you're doing uh, very impressive uh, with your competition. Could you tell us a little bit about your competition history? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, maybe the biggest thing is that uh, when I got my black belt 2014, I also uh, won the Worlds as a black belt then. So that's my biggest achievement Uh until uh, this far. Uh, yeah, I've been doing quite well in the competitions, and competition has been always something I want to do with my jiu-jitsu. So uh, even though I've been studying or working at the same time, I've been really focusing on the competition. Wow. Uh, that... Trying to compete as much as possible. Are you... I'm trying to understand a little bit as far as... Um the time are you guys both uh doing full time activities and jiu jitsu uh yeah so uh, uh basically we you started uh, 8 years ago and i started jiu jitsu 9 years ago and we have all the time done uh, studying or work besides besides jiu jitsu yeah. yeah so we started this as a hobby in the beginning and now it's a really serious hobby <laughs> yeah but it's still, it's not a profession. Wow. And uh, did you guys meet through jiu-jitsu? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that, it, do you, I think it's, it's great that you guys are trading together, and I think it's probably a, a huge impact as far as uh, how you've been able to pick it up so quickly. It's really an amazing accomplishment to uh, to win Worlds uh, the first year that you've that you've been eligible as a black belt. That's that, that's mm-hmm. very rare to have somebody do that. And is also Vinla, you're going to ADCC. Yeah, I I got an invitation to the ADCC, and the it's now in Finland, so it's really really huge <laughs> thing that I uh, get to compete in my home country as well. Wow, that that will be an amazing experience, and uh, it'll be it'll be fun to watch you as a fan uh, compete. Um, how are you guys preparing for the uh, for ADCC? Well, uh, at the moment, because I'm a teacher, I have summer holidays, so this is a perfect <laughs> perfect time to make a bit more training. But uh, basically, yeah, we try to we do as we uh, as we always do. We follow the quite similar training routine uh, during the summer. Uh, we have a little less uh, responsibilities uh, teaching the classes, so we have a bit more time for ourselves and our own trainings. But uh, basically, our trainings, um, we train from five to seven times a week, approximately, uh, BJJ, and then maybe maybe some other activities as well. But uh, that's usually that's usually what we do. Yeah, and we try to use the time we are on the mats as good as possible. So uh, there has to be focus every time and try to keep it quite simple. Uh, a lot of drilling and uh, uh, I think the positional sparring. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think push, positional sparring is uh, is the, the one exercise that we do the most uh, because it's uh, it's also a way to work your conditioning. So you don't have to do that many conditioning trainings on top of the BJJ trainings uh, because uh, when we don't have the holidays, we have a lot to do during the days. Uh, the the medical studies they take a lot of time and Venla's uh, work days they are also long so we we cannot do two trainings a day every day uh, so uh, we really uh, we are, are really trying to use that mat time as well as possible and to work all the aspects in one training the conditioning and the techniques and the sparring. How how do you decide what uh, positions to work on? when you're doing positional sparring? Quite often it's uh, either guard passing or playing the guard or then uh, stand up. So basically most of the time it's those three positions or those three areas we are working on. And, uh, when it's uh, when the bigger competitions are further away, we work on the, the weak positions. Uh, for example, currently I feel that my guard is the weaker position for me, so I'm working on guard. But when, uh, the closer the competition comes, the more we focus on the strong positions and uh, the, the stuff that we are going to that that in, uh, goes into the game plan. I, I want to know a little bit about uh, the game that you guys play as far as your favorite maybe moves or positions. Uh, Hannah, I'll start with you. What, what are your favorite things that you like to do on the mat? Uh, I'd have to say takedowns, actually. <laughs> I, uh, I have always liked takedowns. And uh, since we moved to Sweden, we, we got a really great wrestling coach. And uh, I I have been really, really into the takedown game. Unfortunately, I have a few bigger injuries, uh, chronic injuries that uh, make it a bit difficult with the certain stand-up uh, techniques. So, uh, but if I, if I have to say one favorite position or one favorite game, it's uh, definitely takedowns. And, and Venla, do you have a favorite part of the game? Uh, I think my passing game is stronger than my guard game. Uh, normally I want to h- end up in top. Uh, uh, I feel that I'm much stronger there, but then that it has uh, changed during the years and normally I make the game plan according to the uh, opponent. So my goal is often uh, always to end up to the top position, but it might be takedown or it might be sweep, depending on the opponent. So, uh, but top game. <laughs> yeah. D- so. does, it sounds like you both prefer to uh, play top game if, uh, Hannah, you're looking for the takedown. And, and Vinla, you like to pass the guard. So they're both very similar, it sounds like. Um, does it change gi no gi, or is it the same basic game plan? It's, I, I'd say it's pretty much the same. Yeah, same for yeah. both. Mm-hmm. Uh, the guard came, game is a, it's a bit more wor- versatile in BJJ. With but, the gi, yeah. Yeah, with the gi. So uh, maybe there is a bit more emphasis on the the guard game in BJJ, but it's basically it's the same. And we have both uh, trained no gi and gi uh, all the time, like both. So like 50-50, depending on the competition, we are training more or less with the gi. So both have always been our uh, yeah, training. So we haven't started with the gi and then continue to no gi, but it's uh, both at the same time. Yeah. So even when you're getting ready for uh, Worlds for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or for ADCC, you're still doing the other one a little bit, but it's just less... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially now that we are teaching a lot of classes, and we have a lot of guys competing in the, in the smaller competitions, so we feel it's important that we are uh, there and help them in their preparations. So if there's guys training for BJJ competitions, we we do also BJJ, even though we are training for ADCC. I kind of have a, an interesting idea here, and and let me know if you need time to think about it. But uh, I would like to hear you guys comment on each other's 
uh, grappling. So, Vinla, if you could give a compliment to Hannah, her game or her training uh, method, um, it'd be nice to hear. Uh, about Hannah's game, she's really um, uh, moving, uh, really good, uh, moving a really good way. So it's not like uh, stalling, but uh, especially when she's doing her top game, it's really hard for me because she's consistently uh, changing the direction or the angle. So it's hard to uh, <laughs> keep on sometimes because uh, she's coming on the right side and suddenly she's on the left side. And it's that's maybe her strength. Uh, and then the biggest strength she has is in coaching, I think, because I have got so much from her and she's the one who is always uh, putting more time on our training, actually, and thinking for me as well. <laughs> And what we should do and how we should, uh, we should train and I have learned really a lot from her how to how to train with this kind of uh, uh, life situation we have that we have this limited time on the mats and how we can use it 100% so that's really her strength and to give so much to the others and sometimes I think uh think that she doesn't have time to con- concentrate on her own game as much as she, she helps the others. Wow, that that uh, sounds like a great uh, person to have uh, training with you every day. Yeah, <laughs> the perfect, <laughs> perfect for me. <laughs> yeah. oh. oh, wow, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Do we, uh, can we switch that question around? Yes, I think I'm ready. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> I uh, I really admire when Lass, uh, uh pressure game when uh, uh, she's uh, she's on the top. She has uh, a great way way of using her not only her size and strength but also her movement. Uh, so it's not just that she goes into half guard and tries to to smashed the partner but she's really moving and replacing her pressure exactly where it's needed so I really I think it's fascinating to watch her passing the guard and the whole position positional control is uh, it's great she can keep on going like if you if you talk about position sparring she can keep on going and it's always a beautiful smooth movement from one uh, position to another so that's really that's really amazing, and uh, the thing that I I admire the most is her uh, mentality in competitions because she's so uh, natural and she doesn't she gets nervous but she doesn't get nervous the way that would ruin the game. She doesn't care about other people's opinions and she doesn't experience like a uh, pressure. Uh, from the performance, so she's really relaxed and natural on the mat. And uh, even though she sometimes loses, uh, she doesn't let that uh, bother her too much. So it's a uh, it's a really great mentality, and uh, there is so much I can learn from that that mentality. And I will learn from that mentality, hopefully someday. Yeah, that that is awesome as well. And yeah, having the if you're going to compete, you're going to lose sometimes. That's just the the, the way it goes. And being able to 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 not let that really bother you and and uh, and be able to move on and and learn from that is very important. Uh, Hannah, yeah. you've mentioned several times that you have had an injury or injuries. Um, how did those happen? Or, and and what's going on? Are are you are you okay? Or are you uh, nursing an injury now? Uh I I I'm not I don't have any acute injuries right now so I'm a, I have been able to train train as as normally as possible uh, a few of the injuries I have had uh, previously have a chronic nature so they are, I can feel I can feel the old injuries every day so I know what's going on in the body and I'm not 100% anymore so that's definitely something I have to be aware of all the time when I'm on the mat, in the trainings and in the competitions. And especially in the competitions, that's uh, it's not the best feeling to have in your mind, the, the, the feeling that I'm injured. And I know that if 
I get injured again, it's going to be really bad. So, but uh, oh, I I have managed to keep on going, anyways. Yeah. So, are you avoiding certain maybe positions or techniques that might uh, make the injury uh, more likely to to come back? Yeah, yeah. I have a uh, uh, like I said, I love stand up game. I love takedowns, but. Uh, where uh, it's uh, very often I have to I have to be aware of the, the stand up game and who am I facing in the the trainings and who am I facing in the competitions and it's often uh, depending on the size of my opponent and the game they have I have to try to find them not even the best way for me to fight but the most safest way for me to fight so I really have to adjust my my techniques. Uh, both in in competitions and in the trainings, to the, the the situation in my my body. Wow, that and I think that's common for people, you know, to make that. Um, it's important if you are dealing with injuries to make some changes, uh, so you can yeah. keep training. Yeah, yeah, definitely, and that's uh, I think uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is so beautiful sport because there is so many ways to do this sport and be successful competitor or, or keep on developing if you don't kill, compete. So even though you have injuries, you can, you can keep on going if you just play it smart and don't have too much ego. And are, you have to also be willing to, to learn new stuff. If you, if you notice that, gee, I cannot do this anymore because it's hurting, you have to be willing to learn uh, another way around the problem. So uh, that's uh, that's the beauty of the sport. Whenever I get a chance to interview somebody, or I guess two somebody's uh, internationally, I like to kind of check in and see what's happening there. So, like the state of jiu-jitsu in Scandinavia, or I know you guys do a lot of traveling as well and teaching mm-hmm. and competing. I like to hear kind of how things are locally there for you guys. Uh, at the moment, we are living uh, in the. Örebro, central Sweden, and it's a kind of small, uh, small big city here. We have a like uh, most of the clubs in uh, Scandinavia, Finland, Sweden are working on a, as a non-profit organization or a voluntary basis. So it's a club where we have uh, maybe ten to fifteen people giving the trainings. Uh, both in MMA, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and uh, submission wrestling. wrestling. We have also wrestling. Another club is we are maybe seventy people um, on the grappling side, a little bit less. Yeah, I think we're like twenty people doing grappling at the moment. Uh, and our history in Finland has been quite the same, but um, uh, Hanna started in a different gym. But most of the time, we have been training in Uvascula. You must be a fight club, and it's the same basis that there. Those who have been training uh, a longer time are giving their trainings, and uh, it's all voluntary, voluntary work. Yeah, so, so we have never had a like a sensei or a master or what do you call it, a coach. coach. So it's uh, it's it has always been a group of people teaching each other, and um, when we started BJJ. Uh, 2008 2009 there was only one black belt in whole finland and uh, just a handful of brown belts so the the situation was very uh, self-made <laughs> so to speak that and that's amazing yeah. that you guys are are competing and doing very well and you know never had um you know a formal coach or 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 a lot of uh, guidance could could that have maybe been somewhat of an advantage or could you how do you make that uh, make that work? Well, I think one uh, advantage it has been that we both have started teaching in quite early phase of our career, and when you are teaching, you have to constantly uh, look for new stuff and uh, try to develop your own game, but also the other people's game. And as I said before, that's one of Hannah's uh, uh, strengths, and she really can uh, develop also the system. How how can we learn the best way? Uh, because normally it's 
quite uh, quite often it's like that that you go to the trainings you make a small warm up and then you learn uh, from one to three techniques and then you spar and next day you come you maybe have different techniques and it's really hard to learn that way I think and then uh, because we haven't had any coach we have to find out how we can learn better and faster and <laughs> Uh, make the make the training smart. So I think that has been an advantage also. Yeah, I think so too. Because in uh, when you don't have anyone telling you that you should do this or you should play this game, and I think this would su- suit you. You maybe you try a bit more different techniques. But the most important thing is that you have to learn how to think yourself. Because nobody else is doing the thinking for you, and I think that's a that's a huge advantage, especially now that we have been doing a BJJ for a while. And uh, when now when we account uh, when we face new new games or totally new techniques, it's I find it quite easy to adapt myself or learn the new stuff because I have we or we both have been we have been forced to learn how to think <laughs> if you if you understand what we mean <laughs> yeah um you, you talk a little bit about you know not showing you know three new techniques every day uh, to a class how do you guys i kind of want to see what a class is like uh, there i know you guys do a lot of positional sparring but can you maybe walk me through do you guys do warm up stretches positional sparring new techniques what are you guys doing in a typical class uh, well, uh, regular uh, all the classes and also all the open mats start with a warm up. That's we are. That's something we are really strict about because uh, this is a contact sport. And in order to keep on doing this for uh, the rest of your life, you have to uh, take care of your body. And if you just hop on the mat and start rolling or doing the techniques, and your body is uh, not warm, you're, there is a huge risk for injuries. So we always start the, the warm-ups. It's uh, a bit of running, uh, body weight exercises, dynamic stretching. That's a really important part of the, the, the warm-up. Uh, not just a regular um, static uh, stretching, but the dynamic rest, the stretching. And then uh, right now we are working in three weeks um, blocks. So for three weeks, we have the same team in the, the trainings. For example, uh, uh, Butterfly Guard. And w- how we build the trainings is that in the, the first week, we go through the very basics of the, the Butterfly Guard. We start, we, uh, often we don't start with one technique, but we start with the, um, a move, uh, moving exercises. We show how to move in that position because uh, what I found difficult in the beginning when we when I started to train was that we saw techniques from a certain guard but then when we started sparring of course your opponent is moving and you I never got to try the techniques because I had no idea how to move and how would my opponent move so we are always trying to include those moving uh, drills uh, in the trainings and usually that part comes after the the warm-ups so we we go into the position uh, through the moving moving drills, and then we we love the basics in this sport. I I like to say that our shishitsu is quite boring because we do so much basic stuff, basic sweeps, and that's not only the classes we teach, but also when we are training together, we we repeat the basic stuff all the time because I I think that's the that's where the, the, the success lies in the competitions, uh, especially uh, in the competitions, especially that you, you have really good, good knowledge on the basics. And uh, usually in the, in the three weeks block, the, the first week is really basic. So it's a lot of movement drills and then uh, basic stuff. And then the next week we add new techniques but we always build on that basis, that basis of movement and the basics. And then we add the, the more complicated submissions or more, more complicated sweeps or more complicated passing, passings to the, the stuff. And then usually 
after this one comes the position sparring, positional sparring, and uh, which is followed by the the, the normal sparring. And uh, yeah. And normal sparring, we try to always uh, start uh, standing up. So as the match is starting in the competition, you always have to, if you are do a takedown or pull a card, but you always have to start standing. So yeah. we try to have as many sparring rounds as possible with that kind of start. Do a lot of your students compete? Well, yeah, in the national level, uh, the Swedish and Finnish uh, smaller competitions, quite many of the students compete as at least like uh, from one to four times a year. four times a year. And then we have few ones who are <laughs> traveling more <laughs> and also competing internationally. Most of the people are uh, in the beginning of the jiu-jitsu journey. We have. Um, Especially many girls who have been training with us in Finland who are constantly coming to the same competitions with us <laughs> and uh, competing there. Yeah, so we have like this small group of like five to ten people traveling also uh, and doing the international competitions. Well, that that's really cool. Um, you mentioned a couple uh, uh, other women on the team. Is your team... Uh, mostly men or is it kind of split a certain way um kind of interested in the makeup having having you two there uh, helping out so much at, with the with the team how many men or women are on the team well on our club in sweden uh we are mostly men <laughs> uh i think most of the clubs in uh in the whole world yeah yeah no it's us two and maybe uh, two three Active girls, yeah. yeah, at the moment, mostly men. And then in Finland, um, we had a quite big part of our training partners were women as well. There it's maybe like from 15 to 20 yeah. girls at the club. And the club is there a little bit bigger, 200, 200 people. Maybe. <laughs> Not maybe that much, but no, maybe 100 active trainers so uh there we had more more women uh, training with us yeah actually there is a um uh the girls group we have in finland it's it's actually the first girls group in finland uh we started the girls only classes 2011 no 2010 yeah and then we had the first beginners courses only for women uh 2011 and now it's still once a year we have a beginners cl- uh, classes only for women uh because many girls find it uh, easier to to come into the sport through those classes but uh as as i said we started the the, the girls only uh, classes 2010 and it has been really popular and we have been building the girls team uh, ever since and like Venla said it's now from 15 to 20 girls training there uh, which is really awesome it's not uh, like a huge city so it's a uh, it's a great group and and uh, great girls and it means that they are twice a week they are training uh, girls only and then other trainings are with uh, men as well but there is always a few times a week you get to train only with girls. Is that a big difference uh, as far as when you compete to to train with other women? Or I imagine a lot of your trainings with just with with guys, especially like back in 2014, uh, Vinla when you won uh, Worlds. Was that a challenge as far as not having a lot of women to train with? Or were the men grappling in a similar way that the women uh, were at the competition? It has definitely made a big uh, difference for us when we started the girls group and when we got, even though most of the girls had been training a few years less than us, but we have always tried to find a way to uh, use everybody (laughs) in a way that uh, if we find out that uh, this uh, girl or guy has really good passing, we try to play our guard against uh, her or him and uh, especially with the less experienced uh, girls and guys, we have found important that we, for example, let them take the back and we start the fight there 
to make it harder for us. And I think the training with a lot of with girls has really made a difference that because even though everybody trains with guys, so I think the way the girls move and uh, do their uh, use their body and uh, do the techniques is a little bit different, and I think it's a huge advantage in the competitions if you can also train with the girls because we fight against the girls. Yeah, and uh, especially for me as a, as a bit smaller person, uh, I was previously fighting in the lightweight category and minus 60 category in ADCC, and nowadays I'm fighting uh, mainly in medium weight, so I'm not the, the biggest. Uh, biggest girl there is, so it's really good for me if I get the get the chance to train with girls, because there, of course there is always guys who are my size, but they, like Venla said, they they move differently and they are much more explosive than girls are. So uh, I think that's the biggest difference. It's not only the the the, the strength, but it's the ex uh, explosivity that's uh, that makes it a very different game with the guys. So uh, for me, it's really good. With the guys, I feel that I get to ex uh, practice my defense game much more. But then with the girls, I have a chance to, to practice and polish my my attacks as well. Because then there is no no size or strength or explosivity uh, difference. And then one thing which has helped us and... Uh all the women in Finland is that the women in Finland are doing a lot of uh, together a cooperation. We have uh, camps together. Most of the women they visit other gyms. There are open mats that we're trying to find the uh, time and place to train with other women as much as possible. Uh, so it's just not just our club, but the whole community in Finland. Also on the uh, men's side, it's really open and it's really, really easy to go and visit other gyms in other towns. So, a lot of open mats, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of uh, cooperation between the clubs. So it's it has helped a lot. Yeah, that that's really nice that every uh, that the clubs are cooperating with each other and and people are are helping out we have a, a mutual friend denise and she introduced us but uh she attended a seminar are you do you guys teach seminars is it just basically a summer thing for you when you're able to to do that sort of thing or um tell me a little bit about your seminars well uh, we are we are not really selling seminars but then we got asked sometimes so it's okay. around five to ten seminars per year yeah yeah something yeah. like that it has uh uh, we have gotten um, much more invitations since we moved to Sweden. Uh, so it's from five to ten seminars a year. Yeah, we, we try to find a place uh, during the spring. We had maybe four or five now. So, yeah, there is always time for uh, short visits. Like uh, with Dennis, we were one weekend in Berlin. Yeah. We did one uh, one full day of uh, of uh, seminar and then we had an open mat the next day. Yeah. yeah. Do you have certain things you focus on during the seminars that you uh, teach at every seminar, or is each seminar different? Uh, we always try to. <laughs> first of all, if it's uh, one training or two days, we try to find a team. That if it's a whole weekend, it's always. Uh, it can be the same team both days or one day can be uh, top gang and one can be from the bottom but uh, I think that we try to uh, introduce as well the, the way we train so the um, techniques can be different but the way of training is quite similar what we do in our our no daily <laughs> training that, uh, like we say, that we try to introduce a position and maybe the key points there and then add techniques. Of course, in the seminars, it might be more techniques than in one class, but uh, the way of uh, training is the same. That there are often positional sparring that you get to train your, train your new techniques and try them with the <laughs> moving opponent. 
than that has been maybe the uh, common thing. Yeah, and the, uh, yeah, uh, we we try to um, we try to teach a game instead of just a few techniques. So, uh, like Wendla said, it's really much like the ideology of our normal trainings that we want to show people a position and how to move in that position because we think the movement it's so important that you know how to move because if you know how to move in the position you're playing it's it gets so much easier to apply the techniques so so that's usually we we like to say that today we are going to teach you a game and then uh, to learn a game uh, to learn a technique you you might learn a technique through repetitions but in the game you have to you have to play the game so that's a, that's a lot of movement and positional sparring and that's the that's the way we teach and that's uh, uh, that's what we are trying to give for people because we think that, that it's so much more than just uh, just uh, good techniques because yeah shujitsu is it's movement so you you got to know how to move yeah that that's interesting and it sounds like you're you're teaching them the game you're teaching them uh, your training methods. So when you guys leave in a couple of days from that place where you were doing a seminar, they, they maybe have not just learned a new technique, that they've learned a, a game, and then they've also learned some training methods and some ideas that could help them in any part of their game. That's, yeah, that's what we the, hope. That's the goal. <laughs> that's the goal. Of course, it's a... Uh... Especially in the beginning, I thought that when uh, I attended some seminars, it was really hard to uh, learn the new techniques because you had them in the seminar, and then the next week when you went to regular trainings, you maybe did something totally different. So uh, uh, that's <laughs> that's why we also try to give the way how to how to train the the game or the techniques after the seminar also, and yes. Yeah. It's always really good situation if your teacher is at the seminar at the same time and you can continue with the same team next week or so that otherwise it might be really difficult to uh, get <laughs> yeah learn the new techniques from the seminar or the new ideas. Yeah, I, I always think it's interesting where uh, jujitsu and maybe the the ideas or something uh, from jujitsu kind of helps you in another area of your life. Uh, Vinla, you're a, a teacher. Has jiu-jitsu helped you become a better teacher? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't know. The children are acting really good. Because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, my, my uh, teaching uh, or the pedagogical thinking has actually helped me in jiu-jitsu more than my jiu-jitsu in teaching. But of course you get the kind of, um, how do you say, you carry yourself in a way that you have a natural authority, I think. And that might be helping with the kids, but uh, it might be more than the teaching <laughs> has been helping jiu-jitsu. <laughs> Yeah, and and Hannah, you are uh, in medical school, which I don't, I can't even understand how hard that is. I know uh, school was hard enough for me, and I know medical school is is a way more uh, difficult and challenging uh, than than anything I've done. But uh, has jujitsu helped you in medical school, or has medical school kind of helped you with jujitsu in any way? Uh, Jiu-Jitsu has definitely helped me with the medical school and in life. I, I feel that I have gained so much more confidence through Jiu-Jitsu that I, I don't know if I had had the courage to to to, apply, uh, to search for uh, to medical school if I hadn't started Jiu-Jitsu. Because I feel that uh, all the years of training has have given me better... Uh, perspective of myself as a person and of my capabilities and my limitations and how much I can push my own limits so it has uh, mm. it has been a huge game changer for me in in life and in medical school it's uh, uh shushitsu has given me so much like mental strength 
that uh, you definitely need that in, in medical school because the days are long and when you're studying for the exams and you're tired and you have been studying for 14 hours, you, you definitely need that, that mental strength and you definitely need to know how to push your limits and how to motivate yourself and that's something you do in the like in the competition trainings or when you're preparing for a big competition and you have been having a camp for two months so uh, that's the same thing you you start to get tired and you you start to get unmotivated and you have to know how to keep on going so that's uh yeah that has been a huge deal for me the whole whole pizza chain and uh, yeah yeah that I could I could definitely see how that would help you in those difficult times and I think for both of us it has been really good way to have balance in life that you have the work and you have the studies but after that you have something else as well that for example for you in medical school it's quite uh, common that all the Students in medical school, they just want to learn and learn more. And it's really hard to say that uh, now I have to, you never learn everything. So I think it's really good to have the trainings and you have something else. Yeah, definitely. Else after school that you know where to, (laughs) when to study and when to rest from the studies and do something else. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's, uh, in medical school, there is so many, so ambitious and so... Uh, good <laughs> students that you, I can never reach the same level of uh, of knowledge as they do have. But then, on the other hand, there is so many people with huge amounts of stress, and they feel so much pressure because they feel that they cannot learn it all, which nobody can, nobody can learn it all. So I think it's really it's a huge deal for me to have BJJ. And uh, have that ability to say that, okay, I'm done for today and uh, I have done everything as well as I can. But now it's time for, for the trainings and uh, and the, the relaxation. Yeah, I think that's an important uh, way to try to find balance in your life. Yeah. You don't want to have too much of anything in particular. Uh, often, even if it, if it seems really good, it could lead to burnout and uh, frustration. Yeah, definitely. And the same goes in... Uh, in shushitsu because oh, I, we also know many people who are doing shushitsu for a living and there is uh, there is similar uh, personality types there that there are people who are experiencing so much stress and pressure because they know that they have to keep on on winning the competitions in order to get more sponsors and get the, the living out of the sport and then if you don't have anything else besides shushitsu it's uh it's the same thing it can get really stressful and i uh, uh, our wrestling coach here he's a really really great guy uh and he keeps on talking about balance even though we had a uh, uh one young guy was preparing for the the, the world championships uh, our wrestling coach didn't just talk about the winning and the preparing for the, the 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 worlds, but he kept on talking about the balance and you have to have to take care of your family and you have to take care of your friends and your school and your work because if one of those areas starts to fall apart, then everything falls apart. And not to mention, if you only have one thing in your life. Even even though it's a medical school or jujitsu or whatever, if that's the only thing you do, there is a huge risk to to collapse if uh, if it doesn't go as planned. So uh, balance it's the, it's the key word, and uh, that's we are lucky to have the coach reminding us of that fact. Yeah, that's a, a powerful idea, and, and you guys are really demonstrating that with with your actions it's i'm very impressed with you guys um you speaking of kind of like balance you know uh, you, you guys you're married you live together and you're training jiu-jitsu all the time so when you guys come home are, are you guys talking about jiu-jitsu a lot of times or do you kind of leave that for the mat <laughs> yeah we talk about jiu-jitsu a lot <laughs> other things and other things as well but that's uh um yeah maybe like during the the last two years it has 
it has been a bit less Chuhitsu, a bit more other stuff. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but it's always, you cannot go a day without Chuhitsu, even though you have a rest day and you're not training some part of the day somebody's going to bring up shushitsu and then you're going to talk about shushitsu <laughs> yeah. yeah so that's uh yeah it's in it's it's a part of our everyday life and it's um and especially i love to i i i feel that there is a tiny shushitsu computer inside of me that just keeps on going even though i'm not aware of that it just keeps on working there and then i got all these ideas all these new training uh, drills and all these new positions i want to try and we can we can be talking about something completely different and then i just you know what i have been thinking of this position what do you think <laughs> so uh yeah a lot of shit to talk <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I was guessing that would be the answer, but uh, it, you know, having that use it like a tiny computer inside of you, where that's always kind of running in the background. I think <laughs> you you only get that when you're really interested in something, and if you were just casually interested in jiu-jitsu, that that computer would turn off. And it's really with anything, anything that you find really, you know. Uh, drawn to or or really fascinated with uh naturally you'll think about it even when you're not consciously thinking about it and you'll kind of come up with solutions to problems maybe or you'll you'll come up with an an idea that you might want to experiment with and and that's that that's i guess that's a a big sign that that just is always on your mind is 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 when you're not thinking about it or not talking about it and an idea comes into your head um and 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 suddenly you've got a good idea (laughs) yeah yeah yeah, um, I'd like to get some advice from you guys uh, for uh, students out there training and wanting to do better. Um, do you have any advice for a student that's going to do their first tournament? Relax. It's not so serious. <laughs> that's, no. uh, yeah, that's actually what we, when we have guys or girls competing for the first time, that's something we repeat constantly because what we have learned through our own experiences and through coaching other people is that the, for the most of the people, the hardest part is the, the, the pressure of winning or the, the fear of losing. losing. Uh, and we are tr- just constantly trying to remem- remind them that it's not so serious. And uh, especially the first tournament, how, how to say this nicely, nobody cares. <laughs> But, but this is the idea we're trying to remind them of, that just relax. Don't think about the, the results and just try to focus on one fight at a time. Because uh, the goal is to fight like hundreds of fights during your shushitsu career, especially if you're a competition interested. The, the goal is to, to fight several hundred fights uh, on on your journey journey so one fight here and there it doesn't it doesn't really matter it's the 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 overall picture and the whole journey that's going to define you as a person not that one tournament on one fight in that one tournament so uh so we are trying to trying to make people relax and enjoy (laughs) Yeah, that that's great advice, you know, especially for your first one. Uh, really, only you are going to remember this, so don't worry. Don't put so much stress on yourself that everyone's watching and it's a, a really big deal. Make it a learning experience. Try to relax and, and have the goal of doing this again and again if that's something that you want to do. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and also, we, we like to remind people that it's uh, – the more you fight, the more you compete, the easier it gets. And it's uh, for the 99% of the people, it's it's really difficult to compete. It's so nerve wracking, and you don't know what's going on, and it's so you get so exhausted. But the more you fight, the easier it gets. The more routine you have, the more experience you have, the easier it gets. So especially in the beginning, it's it's more just more about uh, gaining the the experience than gaining all the medals of course we encourage people to win <laughs> but uh, uh but we like to rem- remind people of the, the, the journey as well yeah I'd, I'd like to know what you guys are doing 
um, right before the match as far as warming up or what you're thinking about or or, or, or what you're doing, you know, your match is going to begin in just, you know, an hour or 30 minutes. And, and, and what are you doing to get ready for that mentally or physically? Uh, Hannah, I'll start with you. How do you prepare for your match that's going to be right uh, around the corner? Uh, I warm up. That's the that's a really important routine. And as I as I mentioned earlier, that's what we do in the the trainings as well. So every performance for me starts with a good warm up. And we have this uh, warm up routine where you you warm up the whole body and you have these dynamic stretchings, and then you you take your pulse up a few times. So it's really it's a routine I have been going uh, I have been having for uh, several years and that's uh, it's so safe because then you know that after I am through this routine and my body is uh, it's warm and it's uh, it's ready to ready to hop on the mat and get on going. So that's uh, that's the the most important part for me and that also helps me to prepare mentally because if you're really really excited and nervous you often feel that I don't want to, I don't want to start moving. I just, I'm just too nervous to move. So then I think it's even more important that you force yourself into the routine because you know that that routine helps you to, to, to get your body ready and get your mind off the, the, the nervousness and get your mind uh, ready as well. So that's, uh, that's my number one routine. All right. And that, it sounds uh, like great, uh, advice and it's and it is working well for you uh vinla what do you do right before the the match it's uh it's basically the same and it took me quite many years and quite many competitions to find my routine because uh, i think in the beginning you try so many things that you see that okay they are listening to music maybe i should listen to music and then you see someone to make some burpees and then you think maybe i should do some burpees and uh, <laughs> Uh, it's like uh, I think I have found my routine now during the last two two years, and uh, and as Hanna said, it's a lot of uh, or everything starts from the warm up because when the body knows that it has to be, get ready and fight, then the mind follows. So uh, depending what time you are fighting, I try to. Uh, wake up the body <laughs> first time in the morning that maybe you fight four o'clock in the afternoon but when you have woke up you already do a small warm-up so the body knows that this day we are going to fight and then uh, up, um, one hour before the fight I do the warm-up again and uh, it really helps mentally as well uh, to to get prepared. So when the body is ready, the mind is ready. I like the way you put that. Um, trying to deal with nerves and that sort of thing is the is the first match uh, have more stress behind it than the than the following matches and and even in the finals or are they all about the same? I don't know. It it depends from the competition. Uh, sometimes it's the <laughs> it's the first match, but. Uh, it's also affecting who I'm going to fight with and how are their <laughs> energetic levels of the day. So I don't really have okay. a, like a, it for me, it's not the first match or the second or the finals. It's, it varies. I think okay. for you, it's a bit different. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I think for me, it's the, 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 uh, uh, the most important thing for me is to to get going. So usually it's the for, first fight that's the most difficult for me. After I, I, I after I get going, then then it, it usually gets easier. But I have a I have I'm also famous for get, getting a nervous breakdown before the finals. So if I have a, had a perfect tournament and I have fought my way to the finals, then I then it's really typical for me to start overthinking and get nervous again and then lose. <laughs> But it's a yeah, it's a personal, personal question. And and does having like that routine to warm up your body first and and that sort of thing help you with uh, trying to break yourself out of that having a nervous breakdown? Oh, that's a good question. I um, I haven't found 
um, answer the that question actually, because then usually between the semifinal and the final, you don't have that much time. Yeah. So, uh, and you often in BJJ tournaments, you don't know which exact time you're fighting, so you just have to keep yourself alert and try to see when you're when you have to move towards the mat. So usually you have way, or I have way too much time to think the the fights. So maybe some kind of a small warm up routine between the those two fights may might might help me. <laughs> but I'm still working on that. Yeah, I think it's a, uh, every competitor I think has that you, you're you're constantly working and trying to change things and and find what works yeah. best for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you guys are are both very busy people and uh, are both very good at jiu-jitsu. And sometimes that's really hard to to get that combination. You know, people some people can train all day long, and and and, and especially the younger people who whose bodies could handle that. I know I couldn't train all day long if I if, if I had the time. But a lot of people could only train maybe one or three times a week, and they still want to become good at jiu-jitsu. They may not be able to become you know, world-class, but what advice would you have for somebody who get, who could only train a few times a week? When you go to the trainings, it's really important. And if it's one time or three times, but then it's the focus of training and what you do. I think it's really important to learn how to think in the trainings and not just go and do something and uh, what somebody tells you, but think why I'm doing this and how how do I can move my partner, how can I do this technique. And um, thinking is really, <laughs> really important to uh, adapt, that you can uh, make make the whole map time count. Sometimes uh, for the competitions, we haven't had so much time. To, might, you might get ill or... Uh, have so much things at work that you don't really have a possibility to train that many times in the week. But every time when I go to the mat, I try to think, and now it's time to concentrate to the jiu-jitsu. And maybe start it even before the trainings, that if you just had a possibility half an hour or 15 minutes before the trainings, start to think that, okay, now it's the time for training what I'm going to uh, learn today or train today. So when your brains are with you, you get to learn learn a little bit faster. Yeah. So like a, no, just like no mindless uh, repetitions, but just try to try to focus on what you're doing. And if you don't understand why you are you are training that stuff, just ask, ask and try to try to understand how it's uh, how it's working with the whole whole position and and really try to. Try to keep your focus. And as Venlo said, this is an advice we uh, usually give our to to people training the, the competition classes with us. I I ask them to start focusing on the class ten to fifteen minutes before the training because many people they don't have, uh, as you said, they don't they don't have the whole day for shishitsu. So, but everybody has usually ten minutes before the trainings. So. I try to, I, I myself try to start the focusing already then, and I, I want people who train the, the competition classes to start focusing already then. And it's not like you are not going through like this uh, mantra that today I'm going to win or anything like that. But maybe thinking of the technique you want to try today, or thinking of the the position you want to try today, or just focusing on one thing that you you really want to have extra uh, focus on and uh, so usually I feel that that's uh, that gets your uh, gets your focus on the training and then when you start to train you're much more effective uh, also like physically and we said earlier when the body is ready the mind is ready but the, it goes the other way as well, when the mind is is ready, it's much easier to get the body going and uh, connect the body as well. So uh, make the mat time count and focus mm-hmm. on what you are doing. And if if you face the same problem again and again, everybody is passing your guard, half guard uh, to the right side. We usually, if people come to us with 
uh, this kind of question. What am I, am I doing wrong? Because my half guard gets get passed on the right side. We usually ask, what's the first mistake you made? Because, of course, there is you have to learn all the pieces of shifitsu. They are important. But usually if you start from the beginning, uh, what was the first mistake I did? The, the first mistake was not that I didn't shrimp enough because then your opponent has had already passed your legs and already passed your hips, and the shrimping was the last thing to do. But the first mistake is usually you lose your frames or you you stop moving. So that's the way we are trying to make people think to so that they could learn to think the whole process and the whole position and the whole... Uh, the whole game, not not just one movement, because then it feels that it it's um, uh, when when you learn how to think and how to learn, then it gets easier to get more out of the trainings. Yeah, I think that's wow. That uh, <laughs> you, you said a lot there, and it and it really makes sense. You know, you really got to engage your mind. Uh, and and doing that before you train kind of just preps it. And and you mentioned in, engaging your body before the competition, and yeah. you know engage your mind and think about what you're going to be working on, and and really have that focus while you train. Don't just show up and just go through the motions of of training. It really yeah. understand why you're doing certain things, and and that'll help. And, and, and whether you're training once a week or seven times a week, that process I think is going to help everybody. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think we've covered most of the stuff. Is there anything else that, that you guys want to talk about? We are having a uh, charity event in, in the beginning of August in Finland. And that has been, this, this is now fifth time we are having this uh, Sparathon um, at our home academy fight club in Finland. Um, it's a really cool event. Uh, it's uh, 12 hour, hours of sparring, five minute rounds with one minute pause. And it's for the all, all the sports, grappling sports and uh, MMA, boxing, kickboxing. And uh, we had the first Sparathon in 2014. 2014. And uh, then we had like 150 visitors. But last year we had almost 250 visitors during the whole day. And we have now this is the fifth event and the four, first four events we uh, had gathered um, 10,000 euros for yeah. the, the, the local children's hospital. So uh, we are really, really looking forward to this event as a, as a charity event, but also as a great opportunity to meet people, to meet our Finnish friends and the, gather the whole whole uh, Finnish and uh, Swedish BJJ community together because now we know that there is also Swedish guys and girls coming there which is like totally awesome not just to have that uh, in for your own country but also for everybody and that's the the way we have been doing things in Finland so it's uh, it's so awesome to to get to be part of that it sounds like an, an amazing experience and, and a great charity you're you're raising money for. I couldn't imagine uh, rolling you know that long, and uh, obviously I need to take breaks if that was happening. But uh, it sounds like a, just a crazy and amazing experience that that, uh, that people are uh, getting to take part in. And I'll definitely be looking uh, online for pictures of that. Uh, where can we go to follow you guys on social media? Yeah, yeah, uh, we have a. Facebook athlete page uh, for both. That's our. Uh, we have it together, Venla Hanna BHHA. And then we both have uh, our Instagram and Twitter accounts. <laughs> and then the, for the sparring marathon, you have also uh, Facebook events. We, we like to use quite a lot of Facebook for. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can also find us uh, in Facebook, like as a person. So, uh, so if you if you have any questions or you would like to have a seminar, you can always contact us through the athlete page or as a person. 
Well, that, that's great, and I'll uh, find those. And, and I, I'm already on the the combined uh, Vinla and Hannah BJJ page, but I'll I'll find the rest of them and I'll put show notes. I'll put those in the show notes so people could could find you easily. Do you have any sponsors that you would like to mention? Uh, I, I can thank you, Tatami Fight, for for <laughs> giving me the best gear <laughs> for <laughs> for my journey. And then I have also uh, Jorke. Jorma Kekälä, who I can mention. Um, yeah, that's that's my sponsors. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you guys very much. Uh, any final thoughts that you'd like to share with the audience? Um, try to find the balance in life. Enjoy Shushitsu, but also other things in life. Um, then uh, everything gets better, even Shushitsu. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's, that's a great way to... <laughs> To kind of close this up, I think that you guys are, are, are great examples of finding that balance and you're accomplishing uh, great things on and off the mat. And, and that's really something that uh, that anybody could look up to. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank Hannah and Vinla for taking the time to come out in our show and uh, talk to all of us. And one thing that I, I really got out of this and, you know, I, I don't think I do enough of it is positional sparring. Um, like Byron said, they're you know before the show that they're in an area where they're not at a gym filled with a bunch of superstars they don't have superstars to train with every day they are the superstars so you know they have to you know train smarter train harder like byron was talking about that quote you know they you know they work for so you know if what's working for them you know we should open our ears find out what's working for them and try it and i don't think i positional spar enough and after I uh, listen to that interview, I can tell you, I'm going to s- put a lot more time into positional sparring and uh, see where that takes my game. It will take it upward, Gary. <laughs> but uh, looking at how you roll and knowing you as a as a grappler, you do kind of positional spar a lot. Your your game, but uh, I need more. But you're, I mean, while you're rolling, you're, you're typically in positions that you are working on, and I think that that. Uh, so if if you don't have like a whole bunch of open mat time and you, you're just, you know, you, you get three or four rolls in after class, have an idea of what you want to work on and try to get into those positions. You know, if you want to work, you know, half guard or passing half guard or make sure you get there. It's easier probably to, to work half guard from bottom because you could put yourself there a little easier than uh, trying to get top position which may may or may not be easy for you and then uh, maybe forcing a half guard or maybe picking an opponent or training partner that likes to work half guard for you to try to pass but but i think these are are great tools or great options uh, to try to positional spar while you're rolling and that's really what the the audio book about uh the six games for bjj is to find ways to to train a little bit smarter a little bit differently while you're actually rolling i think gary you do this all the time you when I roll with you, I go from one area Gary's working into the next one, and uh, and it just seems like I'm just kind of in a loop from uh, from bad to worse, and then maybe back to bad again if I'm lucky. <laughs> but uh, I think that's that's a good way to train, and it's not like you're saying, "Hey, let me start with uh, my Kimura setup," but you know, within a few seconds, you're setting up your Kimura, and you get to work your Kimura for a little while. When I roll with Byron, I like to start in a fully deep Kimura with it already behind his back. But uh, Byron doesn't go for that all the time. Yeah, you got to really use that Jedi mind trick for me to fall for that one again. It used to work a lot, but not so much anymore. Yeah, yeah, I've uh, I've slowly gotten wiser, Gary. Well, you're you're you know you you definitely remembering things. Um, hey, speaking of remembering things, we have an article uh, this week from Skirt on the Mat, um, and it's uh, things to remember when learning jujitsu. Um, basically, uh, definitely check out the, the blog there. There's a lot of good stuff on there. Um, this one is from July 17th. Um, I wish I could, you know, give credit to the author, but I've searched and searched and searched and I really don't know who the author of this is. Um, but it's a definitely a great article. Um, they talk about four different things to remember when learning jujitsu. And, and number one is do what works best for you. Um, there's going to be certain moves that are going to work for you, submissions that make sense, and you're going to take to them really well. Um, there's some moves you're not going to take to really well, but the ones that 
you know, just almost seem natural to you, you know, definitely work on those. You're going to find your groove. And like I said, it, they said it's natural. You're going to embrace it. And uh, those are moves that are definitely going to work for you. Yeah. Gary, I'm over here smiling from ear to ear. Uh, it's a, I don't know if the audience realizes that we always take a little bit of joy in a particular clever transition and your transition from remembering to things to remember while uh, learning just through the title of the article. Uh, I, I was really impressed on that, Gary. <laughs> you know, I, I really appreciate that. The bad thing is I did fumble a few words getting there, you know, but uh, I, I made it there and uh, hopefully I will remember these things. Nice. The, the second thing on the list of things to remember while learning jiu-jitsu is to not be afraid to try new things. And this is, I think we all fall victim to this, and, and I'll, I'm a proponent of doing, uh, having something and working on that same thing for quite a while, especially if you've got some experience on the mat. And uh, it's also important to try new things. And they don't have to be like the main center focus of your role, but if you are shown a, a technique from mount and you get mount and the technique is there, give it a shot. I mean, it's, it's what a great way to expand your game. I sometimes have a hard time remembering techniques we did last week. and But if I could try to pull those off while I'm rolling, or if I actually do get to pull that off while I'm rolling, Gary, it's so much easier for me to remember those techniques for weeks, maybe even months, uh, if I could pull them off while I'm rolling. And that's, that's really the, the best way that I've been able to, to incorporate the techniques of the day to my game for days in the future as far as being able to keep those with me is to actually do them that night, that morning, wherever I'm training and, and tr do them on a live opponent. If they work, something clicks in my head, I remember it and I really like it. Yeah, that's something, uh, you know, you've talked to, I've heard you talk to a lot of people about, you know, don't be afraid to try things. And, and I know when I was younger in my career, you were always telling me that and that definitely helped me out. So thank you, Byron. Um, number three, you don't have to master everything, but you should at least be acquainted with it. And, you know, that's kind of how I, I take my game, and I think it's worked for me, is, uh, you know, we, we've talked about having a brick, and uh, I, I've got some moves that I really, really work on. I try to get really good at them. I, I spend a lot of time at it. But it doesn't mean that those are the only moves I'm going to learn. I, I don't like to have a huge toolbox, but I need to know everything. And hey, Byron, you know, I saw that time I said toolbox, not tool bag. <laughs> it's the last time I think you uh, ripped me for about 20 minutes on the show about that. So uh, yeah, I have been practicing. Uh, I was going to get I, you a bag for your tools for your birthday, but uh, yeah. I guess I'll get the box. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's you, you've got your own moves. Your people in your gym that you train with have their moves. And, and your instructor is going to teach you, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. And, and, you know, as we go back to number one, you're normally going to do what's, what works best for you. Um, what, you know, fits your body, what just flows for you. That's probably going to become your brick, but you do need to show up for, show up for class, show up for practice all the time because your instructor is going to show you a ton of stuff and, and you, you're going to need to be exposed to this stuff. You need to, you know, know basically everything out there, you know, at least know a little bit about it and what's coming down the pipeline. And the more you train, the, the more you're going to learn. Um, but, you know, it's not going to be, you know, it may not be a position. You may not like De La Hiva. You may not like re reverse De La Hiva. But, uh, you know, as time goes on, you definitely got to be acquainted acquainted with it and uh, know what's know what's going on from those different positions. Yeah. I, and looking at my game, I've got some definite, areas of weakness. You mentioned Daily Hiva. I basically don't have a Daily Hiva card, Gary. If somebody's working on that, I could give them some tips and, and tell them what they uh, should try to be doing. But if they say, what's your favorite thing to do from there? Uh, go to Butterfly. <laughs> 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 Transition to Deep Have. I don't know. There's, there's a lot to do from there, but uh, it's not going to be Daily Hiva related. But And that's okay. I mean, it's... Yeah. Uh, as somebody like Gary and, and me have been on that for quite a while, it's, we need to pick up these things. And it's definitely important because I have to pass the Daily Hiva Guard on a regular basis. I need to know what you're trying to do when you're playing Daily Hiva on me so I could not let you do that. Uh, yeah. Other than that, you know, you don't, you, there's really not time to explore all assets or all parts of the game. And that's okay. You pick your pick what's most enjoyable. Pick what's most effective for you and your body type, and go and have fun. And having fun is uh, number four on the list. Have fun. 
And uh, I think, you know, it says things to remember. I think you can forget to have fun. For, you know what? You probably have a, have a job or a family or school or other obligations that you uh, need to be doing uh, from time to time. You come into jiu-jitsu, and if you leave grumpy, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> That's all there is to it. This should be an enjoyable activity. This should take away stress, not add to it. it you, I, I understand there'll be times when you're uh, driving home and you're frustrated with your game and you're thinking, man, I feel like I took like 10 steps back. I feel like the, the person I was a few months ago would just beat me today. Uh, that's normal. It, occasionally you get frustrated with, with how you're doing. But in general, remember to have fun. We're doing this for fun. We're, if you're likely to be getting in fights and need self-defense all the time, uh, you need to change that. And I don't think that's really anybody who's doing <laughs> jiu-jitsu. You know, have fun and you'll naturally uh, get in better shape because this will be an enjoyable activity. I wouldn't have been able to grapple for three and a half hours a day if it wasn't fun. I'd have quit long ago. I don't want to run for more than 20 minutes because it's not that fun for me. But uh, I could sure grapple for a little while. Yeah, Byron's definitely a, a grappler. A grappler. <laughs> I, I thought you were going somewhere with that one, but uh, yeah. No. Yeah, Thanks, I mean, Gary. Yeah, you did have a good transition there, too, to the have fun. So I was going to bring that up, too, just to let you know you did a good job. Well, thanks, Gary. You're always making me uh, have fun while I'm doing the podcast, my man. You know, you think about it. We're on episode 199. We wouldn't keep doing this if we weren't having fun, would we? Yeah, it's uh, not too bad. We had had a good time. Things to remember when learning jujitsu. We could say things to remember when podcasting. You know, you, we talk about how so much jiu-jitsu in life goes together. I mean, same thing with podcasting. You know, we want to have fun. We don't have to master everything. Like, I'm the funny guy and Byron's the dull guy. <laughs> yep. Um, don't be afraid to try new things. I mean, Byron's the smart one and figures out, you know, new ways to take the show and do what works best for you, um, which is uh, um, talk on the radio because we don't have uh, the good looks <laughs> to be on uh, TV. <laughs> that is true. Uh, that's the main reason why the YouTube channel is struggling <laughs> is because our looks come into play. But uh, yeah, uh, the big one on that one for the podcast to me is uh, have fun and don't be afraid to try new things. We're always experimenting with the podcast. And anytime we bring on somebody that we don't know, it's going to be a little bit of an experiment. And that's that's really fun. You know, I, I did not know Hannah and Vinla at all when I called them. And within 10 minutes, we're recording the show and you get to hear uh, me learn about them and, and kind of uh, figure out what they're doing over there, which is so amazing. But uh, so many new experiences with this that we've had. And, and uh, uh, yeah, one of the biggest things is do what works best for you. Uh, we, we like to interview. Gary and I like to get on here and, and kind of tease each other a little bit and poke fun. And uh, and, and we never did good. that at the start. You know, it's uh, we were actually kind of nice to each other when we first started, but uh, <laughs> now it's uh, all out war. We, we were... We've always been this way off air, and I think it's just kind of seeping into the uh, to the podcast. Yeah, <laughs> Gary's yeah. always been a prankster. That's all there is to it. You like to you like to have a good time, buddy. Yep, jokes and jokes, jokes and jokes. To keep these jokes and jokes going, we have started a Patreon page. We started, Gary. It's been about a year, uh, I think, a little bit over, and we've got some people on there supporting the podcast. And how Patreon works is you would pledge. Uh, and I've really streamlined it, either a dollar or three dollars per episode. So every episode, uh, at the end of the month, uh, your card will be charged, you know, one dollar per episode, and uh, and that money, most of that money will go towards us, a little bit towards the Patreon people, and it has been a huge help in getting us to uh, build the podcast. We're working on developing an app for the show so sooner or later you can go to the itunes or the google play store and download the bjj brick app and we're going to do some fun stuff with that a little bonuses here and there and uh that couldn't that would not be done with the patreon page uh looking uh, you know we we made uh, stickers recently those wouldn't have been made without the people on patreon supporting us and uh the the big one uh we did get our website crashed uh, by some hackers, and that wouldn't have been fixed without Patreon supporters. So uh, I think the audiobooks have helped keep us going, and Patreon's helping us go to the next level. And uh, we're always looking to take things to the next level, aren't we, Gary? Yep, we always want to take it to the next level. And uh, speaking of taking it to the next level, <laughs> uh, Byron? Yes. Would you Yes. get on with the uh, 
uh, audiobook. Yes, Gary, this is a first. So obviously, you know, we talk about doing new things. We haven't been doing uh, Gary's audiobook for 199 episodes. I don't know when it started, but uh, uh, it, it's definitely less than 100 episodes old, I would guess. I don't know that for sure. But every uh, now and then, a couple times a month, I throw a audiobook title at Gary and ask him to come up with a topic and a description of the audiobook if he were to make it. He usually thinks he's going to make it, and he never actually does. Uh, Gary briefly made fun of my biceps as a small issue or a small topic. I guess small talk is what you said. But uh, speaking with, you know, kind of keeping on track with the muscle theme, here's the title for your audiobook. It's a bit weird but I think it'll sell just fine. Biceps, triceps, quadriceps, pentaceps. The Wounded Cougar's Guide to Weightlifting. Gary, you got a lot going on there, my man. A lot of muscle groups, and evidently you're building muscle upon muscle. Well, yeah, we're actually making up muscles too, the the pentaceps. Um, So, I mean, I don't think that's a real muscle, but uh, we'll talk about it if you put it in the... uh, Put it in the title. Yeah, it's like almost like I don't know where the pentacep would be, but some people have abs, and some people kind of have the abs on top of the other abs that they already have. That's not really fair. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Not fair. Where is the pentacep located? If uh, if you were to to pick a spot on the body. Okay, so let's try to think. Is there anything? Okay, I've got it. Where do you think the pentacep would be? <laughs> it's right behind the patella. Nice. Yeah. It basically connects your patella to your quadricep. Wow. Yeah. So it's on your upper patella. Man, I'm, I'm just impressed by, by you coming up with a whole new muscle. If you're one of our med students that's, that's going to Jitsu, going to med school, and, and really working on the anatomy part of med school... You just got yourself an A, my friends, by learning on this podcast where the pentacept is located. Yeah, I mean, Byron works out hard every day. I mean, he talks constantly, and he's got the strongest mandible I've ever known. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Gary, for that one. And uh, talking is becoming uh, uh, a strengthening of my mandible, I suppose. You know, I always use the word wounded cougar, and that's for somebody who's really aggressive, feels really strong, really crazy. And that's what this book is going to be about. It's going to be about making all your muscles very strong so you feel like a wounded cougar. I mean, what could be the possible great nickname that you could get? Somebody could say you're a wounded cougar. I mean, that's an awesome nickname. And basically, it just means you're you're crazy strong. So basically, I'm going to take you through probably 15 to 20 different chapters, and we're going to have great workouts. I mean, it's not going to be like, you know, Richard Simmons style workouts. These are going to be hardcore workouts. And I'm not just trying to attract, you know, the male audience. If I was just trying to attract the male audience, you know, I'd probably have somebody different, you know, to, you know, cause this is, this is an audio book. This one's actually going to be a video. Um, if I was trying to, you know, attract just the male audience, I'd have somebody else differently in there. But, you know, I'm trying to attract the female audience. And, and so the guy I've picked to do all the working out, and he's going to wear a really tight singlet because it's going to be none other than Mr. Bicep, Byron Jabara. Well, thanks, Gary. It's, uh, I don't think it's going to sell very well. So, Byron, tell us about some of the poses you're going to do. <laughs> I'm going to do behind the microphone pose. I'm going to do holding the microphone pose. And then also be doing a com- choked completely unconscious while demonstrating a technique pose. All of those I have done. You know, Byron constantly, this is how much, how, how dedicated he is to strength training for jiu-jitsu. While we're on, you know, the podcast, he's always wrist curling the microphone you know just up and down he actually has added weights he's added seven different washers to each side of the microphone to make it heavier and uh he's he takes it serious and it's just going to be a whole bunch of little tricks like that of how to get stronger without you know real weights and uh byron's going to go through all that while wearing a tight singlet so uh it should attract a lot of uh a lot of uh, animals yeah to the show. You, you thought kettlebells came on the scene really really big and you need to wait for the microphone bells uh, to really hit. Is they're going to take over, Gary? With all the new yeah. podcasts coming up and all the new people wanting to, to get those big biceps, there's no yep. better way than to... Yeah. 
I mean, like Byron says, the way he built that body is not with kettlebells. It's with Kegel bells. And Byron's <laughs> built his body, body with Kegel bells. Oh, well, thanks, Gary. Yeah. Uh, I'm working on those one day at a time, my man. <laughs> As George Jefferson would say. <laughs> but yeah, definitely uh, make sure you uh, uh, check this out. It's uh, gonna be it's gonna be out before Talk Like a Pirate Day. We figured that would be a good day to have it come out. You know, people really look forward to Talk Like a Pirate Day, and what's better on Talk Like a Pirate Day than to get yourself a new uh, uh, video and learn how to work out? Gary, a uh, little side topic here. Uh, I think it was a few days ago, and we're recording this uh, in mid-July, actually, uh, mid to late July. So we're recording a little ahead of time for you, my friends. But there was actually, in the United States, a junk food day, a national junk food day. I heard that. I'm like, what in the world? Are we not eating enough junk food? We need to celebrate with a day? No, I think just the junk food companies have bought themselves a day and uh, tried to get some more snacks in their bellies. I don't Yeah, that's just, that's terrible. Um uh, I don't know. I, I, I remember last week or the week before I was talking about a quote I saw from Tom DeBlass about, you know, why take a cheat day of eating? Because, uh, you know, he's talking about one cheat day. You think how many calories you can put in that. And uh, he's like, I don't I don't take a cheat day and I don't, uh, you know, take an off day. And uh, I just thought that was good advice. And then here I come find out we have a National Junk Food Day. Yep. It is July 21st, National Junk Food Day. And guess what, my friends? You missed it. <laughs> so well, uh, I guess we got to wait another year. Yep, and we'll miss it again. We won't announce until after it's passed, so we won't be able yep. to celebrate that. We're announcing the BJJ Summer Camp ahead of time, so because we're recommending that if you can go, we're going to uh, announce days like that after they're already passed, because we don't want you to, to just pick out, pick out on junk food for no particular reason, Gary. That's not a good plan. Yep. Definitely don't pick out on the junk food. Hey, Byron, pass those Oreos. Yep, right there, my man. There's only a couple yep. left. Yep, how many more uh, Mountain Dews you got for me? <laughs> yep, we eat healthy all the time. Yep. Actually, we do try, um, and that's, uh, I think, it's helping me out quite a bit. And, uh, yeah, speaking of, I guess I'll talk about this for a second or two. I uh, I have, I want to become as healthy as I can. And I think jiu-jitsu and my diet are a big part of that, but you can't really just do those and assume you're you're healthy. You kind of need to check every year in July, which is the same year, uh, month as my birthday. I get like a physical, and uh, with that, some blood work and some basic, you know, talking questions and a basic exam, and really trying to to make sure I'm on the right track as far as health goes. And uh, yeah, had my blood work done, and I was able to drop my uh, cholesterol like thirty points from where it was at last year. By, Good job. And I don't know for sure, because everyone's telling me diet doesn't work, but I was eating way too many eggs, and I basically am eating a small amount of eggs now, and my cholesterol has dropped significantly. So it's unrelated, but I might have been able to make it relate for me. But uh, yeah, I, and I recommend it. You know, why not? It, it, it's pretty easy. It's pretty painless. And you can't, you know, you, you look like you're healthy. You feel like you're good, but you don't know, you don't always know what's going on inside. And, uh, and that, a little bit of blood work. And a conversation with your doctor, I had her check out some moles. I don't know if I'm going to get uh, skin cancer, but I want them to find it before it actually becomes bad. And anything else that might be relevant to my age. Every year, my every month on my uh, birth year, no, <laughs> every July, which is my birthday month, is when I plan on doing this. And I did it again this year. I've done it a couple of years in a row. You know, the coolest thing about all that is you just gave out hints to our listeners of when your birthday is at. And I know it's just your way of trying to get, you know, more cards and gifts uh, next July. Yep. It's a little bit before National Junk Food Day. <laughs> so, okay, that narrows it down. So it's before July 21st. Yep. That's right, Gary. Uh, if you want to know my birthday, just ask us on social media, Gary. Yep. On social media, bjjbrick at gmail.com. Uh, you check us out on Facebook. You can ask him there. You really can't ask on YouTube, but check us out on YouTube there also. Yeah, uh, you know, our YouTube channel is doing great because we're now getting a consistent amount of spammers trying to comment on the videos. And that's really taken off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know, we know love why, the spammers. but I keep my phone dings comment. And then it's, somebody's talking about, this is not spam. And and I've never seen a comment that was not spam that said that. So, uh, Speaking of spam, does that count as junk food? Yes, I, I believe it would. There's okay. Enough. Just checking. Yeah. 
Uh, speaking about our social media, we had a lot of fun. And uh, uh, our friend Matt Lowe, he's been on uh, the podcast. It's been quite some time, uh, some of the earlier, in the first 10, I would say, if not the first five, he w- made some appearances. Uh, but he, he's, he goes, hey, man, you should ask on the Facebook page, what are some fun or crazy songs or awkward songs that you've heard while rolling or that would be weird to hear while rolling and my you know i'm so naive i thought yeah it would be kind of fun to to play some of these songs on the podcast and and just kind of like yeah that's funny but uh it quickly escalated (laughs) to songs i've never heard of and that are pretty naughty (laughs) (laughs) so uh if you want some odd songs to grapple to uh check out our uh facebook post there yeah, you imagine that playlist when you're rolling? Golly, I'd probably have to step out of the room. It'd be too awkward. But uh, <laughs> look, it, it, it's back on our Facebook page. It was in, on July 21st, and uh, a lot of people have commented and added songs on there. Uh, I don't recommend uh, playing those songs if there are children in the room or sensitive adults, for that matter. In fact, we're not going to be playing any of those songs on the podcast because they're that juicy. Yeah, and if you do hear a couple of those songs that you don't like, just go to your safe safe space. Which is the mats. The mats. (laughs) Gary, next week, my man, episode 200. 200. Honestly, when we were at episode 100, I couldn't think about episode 200. It's just to think that we had done that much work and to double that much work again, it seems so far away. I mean, two years. We do an episode a week, that's two years. And uh, just that's, I'm 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 proud of it, Gary. I think we've done a great job with this podcast. I think we're really having fun. We're bringing a lot of great information to people. And to celebrate episode 200 next week, we have Corbett Miller, which is one of my favorite guests in the in the in the past. And uh, the way he is passionate about educating kids in jujitsu, and and he has a whole system set up to do a great job of that. I'm really proud to bring Corbett Miller back on the show for episode 200. Definitely tune in next week. Do not miss Corbin Miller and our Milestone Episode 200. Stay sweaty, my friends. And don't forget to do a front double bicep pose. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Jiu-Jitsu.